Hello, welcome to the Turkey Talks. Today we are going to talk the tension between Russia and uh, uh, NATO. Russia suspends its representation at the NATO mission uh, in Brussels. Today we have got Professor Mitat Çelikpala with us. He is uh, a lecturer at the Kadir Has University, uh, specialized on Eurasian and Russian affairs, Russian and Turkish foreign policy. Uh, Professor Çelikpala, welcome to our program. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. I thank um, you. It is my pleasure. It's a pleasure. And also, Kadir, welcome to uh, join this program again. Uh, so we will ask uh, a number of questions to understand the recent uh, tit for tat uh, between the two uh, sides, Russia and the NATO. Uh, Professor Çelikpala, how do you read the recent developments uh, between two sides? Because uh, it seems that it is not only the recent, I think, incident or the decision of uh, Russia to suspend the mission to NATO in Brussels, it seems that there is a also background to this crisis. What's your take on that? Yeah, you are right. Uh, it's an interesting decision, uh, but we, we are expecting such a kind of a development uh, considering what's happening last couple of uh, years or months. Uh, Russia is suspending, as you said, it is diplomatic mission to end uh, seizing its diplomatic engagement with, with the NATO in response to NATO's actions. Uh, they say that accusing NATO as the military alliance of not being interested in e equitable dialogue. And this is very important for Russian authorities because they would like to establish a kind of a mutual uh, relationship with the European uh, actors or transatlantic members of uh, the international community. And this is a structure, a mechanism for consultation, consensus bu building, cooperation, uh, joint decision and joint action. Uh, in which the individual NATO member states and Russia work as equal partners on a wide spectrum of security issues uh, of common interest in Euro-Atlantic region. Uh, and it was established in May 2002. Uh, therefore, it is a, 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 a serious decision to change the flow of events in the uh, coming uh, near future of uh, Russian uh, NATO member state relations that therefore we have to follow what's happening uh, in this area uh, very closely uh, and carefully. I think we came to that point step by step, uh, Professor Çelikpala, because since 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, we have seen that tension really has increased. Uh, and then later on, there has been uh, some accusation uh, such as intervention of uh, Russia in the uh, elections in 2016 and uh, the recent elections. Do you think that also played a role uh, in the uh, in the increase of the tension between the two sides? Uh, we may uh, even go back uh, much further. Uh, relations between NATO and Russia have been strained uh, since Moscow occupied Georgian territories in 2008. Since then, there is a kind of a clash and intense relationship between uh, Russia and NATO member countries, especially the US, and the annexation of Crimea in 2014 ruined this relationship. Therefore, it's a package, I guess. Uh, and NATO's policy towards Russia remains consistent from Russian uh, NATO perspective. Uh, but from Russian perspective, this is unacceptable. Uh, therefore, uh, it is an effective uh, process uh, to have some reflections on Russia's relations with NATO member countries as well. You know, the spirit, the spirit of meetings uh, has dramatically changed under this NATO Russia Council, uh, in which Russia and NATO member states meet as equals at 29 in areas of common interest instead of kind of a bilateral relations uh, between NATO and Russia. This is a new. This was a new format. Uh, it seems that this decision ruins such a kind of a format. And then most probably Russia will try to establish some bilateral relations with the NATO member countries. But as a NATO, uh, it is an important tool or, or venue for all those actors to, dis to discuss transatlantic relations or security issues. And we are uh, losing this venue to discuss all those issues together with Russia. Then most probably Russian authorities may take some individual decisions discussing with the individual members of NATO uh, countries. And this has some direct effects on the issues that the parties agreed on to work together, like to fight against terrorism, crisis management, non-proliferation, -prolifer non 
arms control and confidence building measures, logistics, military to military cooperation, it seems that we are losing this ground to establish some much further relations. And then now most probably Russia is following its own issues and, and agenda and the NATO member countries most probably will follow their own agenda. And it is almost impossible to discuss what will happen to resolve those issues of Georgia or Crimea, what's happening in Ukraine. And we may expect easily such a kind of a clashes between the, uh, the actors or further clashes between the actors. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chalikbala. Kadir, can I turn to you? Let me ask you a question, then you can maybe pose your question to Professor Chalikbala. How this issue is seen in Washington? Because it seems that uh, Washington and the Biden administration is putting more, I think, emphasis on the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Does that mean that NATO will be neglected and uh, how this is seen, whether uh, Biden administration will take this issue as a priority to resolve the uh, conflict or the tension between uh, Russia and the NATO? Of course, U.S. relationship with NATO has been very complicated in recent years as well. With the Trump administration, uh, you know, NATO could be, uh, I mean, there were fears that in Washington that Trump would simply decide to pull out of NATO. And that was something unimaginable uh, for decades for the United States policymakers. So the U.S. has its own a bit more complex relationship with NATO. As you know, Biden tried to reconvene, re rejuvenate the alliance, transatlantic alliance, and then it tried to uh, identify Russia as well as China as the as the potential en uh, enemies or, or uh, you know, opponents uh, that need to be confronted through NATO through the multilateral uh, institutions of the transatlantic alliance. But uh, there was a recognition, if you remember Brussels, in the Brussels uh, summit, NATO summit, uh, the agenda 2020, sorry, 2030 vision uh, said that it, the agenda would have to be enlarged, right? From cybersecurity to trade wars to, you know, even climate, uh, NATO's agenda is in the process of being enlarged and countries like Russia and China pose many uh, mal sort of uh, challenges to the to the transatlantic alliance beyond the typical geopolitical uh, issues including Georgia Ukraine like uh, professor Chelikpala mentioned those are geopolitical challenges Syria as well right the Middle East as well. Russia's influence has increased there in recent years. But even beyond that, you know, there's been a strong debate about the quality of American democracy. Uh, we've seen in the most recent elections, uh, Russia's involvement in those elections, especially in Europe as well, NATO has to now think beyond its traditional sort of security concepts, traditional uh, deterrence concepts. So that's adding fire to the uh, fuel to the fire in the sense that how, how are we going to deal with Russia in this new environment? And at the same time, Russia is uh, most recent incident happened because, you know, NATO accused Russia, Russian uh, officers at the NATO mission of spying. Uh, and expel them and in return Russia said okay I'm pulling out all of my mission. So it is it is kind of uh, like Professor Cherikpa said there is a this is a serious challenge uh, when you know they're supposed to communicate right NATO and Russia it was after the Cold War this was established so that you know we would engage uh, Russia so that there are no misunderstandings and Russia could even be eventually included. Uh, there were scenarios like that, but of course under Putin, Russia has gone through uh, different kinds of foreign policy. I don't want to make that too long, but I wanted to ask uh, Professor Chelikpala as well. Um, how do you see that how uh, Russian challenge for the transatlantic alliance has become you know, multifaceted, uh, not just, you know, regional issues, not only um, 
uh, Russia's influence in the Middle East, but also in the areas of, you know, elections, cybersecurity, um, climate change, um, actually even the the, the uh, northern routes around the North Pole, right? Um, so how do you see that sort of confrontation more broadly between Russia and the Transatlantic Alliance? Yeah, uh, you are right. In fact, uh, how to engage with Russia was, uh, in, in fact, has been a big issue and it was a big question mark for the Transatlantic Alliance and especially Transatlantic uh, side of Transatlantic Alliance. For Europeans, they have some ways and means to establish and to engage with Russia from the energy cooperation uh, or regional rivalries or different kinds of uh, cooperative mechanisms. The EU has itself its own agenda with Russia and they time to time they managed to establish some better relations with Russians. But for the US, this was a big question mark since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Initially, most probably this Russian uh, NATO Russia Council was one of those answers to this engagement and they tried to establish some positive links and, and venues to discuss each and every issue, military and security related issue with, with Russians. And it seems that uh, this council served this uh, uh, aim for a while, but afterwards uh, as NATO member countries, especially the Atlantic uh, side of the uh, alliance started to criticize Russian authorities uh, and Russian authorities expectation to be uh, treated as an equal uh, global power created a kind of a rift and disagreements between the parties. And this is the reason why we have a big question mark uh, and, and NATO is expelling eight Russians it's, uh, why, by saying they are spying on uh, Ru NATO's information systems. More than that, uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg mentioned that the organization had uh, seen an increase in Russian malign activity and therefore we need to be vigilant. For NATO, it is beyond Russian, Russian aggression in the Black Sea, in, in the Caucasus or in the different areas. This is a direct threat to NATO's structures and NATO's information systems. Therefore, this is a kind of a new threat perception from NATO itself and most probably Americans are gonna support such a kind of an idea to, to uh, limit Russian activities. But the question mark is how the European partners treat such a kind of an uh, attitude towards Russia. For Germany, like Turkey, uh, Russia is a partner country in terms of energy or to resolve some regional issues. Therefore, we have to find some other ways to deal or to engage with uh, Russians and Russians have a tradition or understanding that NATO did the same stuff uh, to Russian delegation twice in 2015 and 2018. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why we have a kind of a shrinking mission and at the end no mission at all in, in the Brussels. Uh, we will see some some ways and means, but I don't uh, I, I cannot say that I, I can be an optimistic person on the near future of uh, Western Russian relations, especially the security related issues. We will have some kind of a uh, tense relations most probably in the coming days. And then uh, Professor Chelikpala, maybe we can shift our eyes to somewhere else in that context, in that context because as you have just said, we will see more maybe tensions uh, in the relation between Russia and NATO. If the relations cannot be, let's say, warmed up, if relations remain at the lowest, uh, let's say, point, then we might predict that Russia will become much closer to uh, China and China-Russian partnership will increase in the Eurasian region. Uh, what would be uh, the uh, reaction of uh, NATO and its allies? I think, are they blind to see that, that if the tension goes up and up, then there will be new alliance and new alignment of Russia in the Eurasian region? Kajam, this is a possibility. Uh, under current circumstances, before uh, Russian NATO relations strained, uh, Russians has just started to uh, search for a new kind of a relationship with the Eastern partners, especially China and some other Eurasian countries as well. 
but there is a kind of another tense relations between Russia and China, especially uh, as far as the Central Asian republics and Eurasian territories has concerned. And, and China is a, a big uh, cake, in fact. It is beyond Russian, I don't know, domination, and it is there is not, not such a kind of a equal relations between those actors. And secondly, which is much more important than this perspective, Russia sees itself, itself as a European actor. And this is the reason why Russians are uh, prioritizing transatlantic environment and the Western links. There is a kind of a competition uh, and disagreements, and it's not easy to establish better relations with the Western actors, but Russian authorities, including the current administration, they see themselves as a kind of a European global actor. And this affects, therefore, better relations with the East uh, does not complement it for Russia with the Western relations. This is the reason why we see Russia, for example, in Syria, in Eastern Mediterranean, in East Europe, uh, to show its leverage and it is a position in the European network or transatlantic alliances. Uh, it might be important for Russian authorities to uh, re-establish some kind of a better relations with the Americans, with some European actors. This is a priority for those guys. But beyond that, in terms of trade relations, establishing new kind of infrastructures uh, to be a kind of a hub between East and West, from China to Europe, uh, it, it serves Russian interests. But beyond that, threat perception of Russians, their expectations of future Russia, or to have a kind of a uh, area of uh, sovereignty and, and a, a kind of a uh, effective uh, area of influence they in search of such a kind of an influence area they always look at west not the east uh, this is a fact and what is the attitude of the western actors towards russia under current circumstances is an important thing increasing energy prices uh, increasing energy demand most probably will affect European actors of NATO to think twice and to find some ways to moderate or to, to go between the Atlantic side of uh, the relations and Russia. Uh, we will see some, some initiatives most probably, uh, but the East, especially Eurasia, is not complementary for Russia to, to, to the West. Uh, Kadir, do you have any question to uh, Professor Celikpola? I think we need to talk about um, something uh, Professor Cekpala mentioned, uh, Germany and Turkey's relationship with Russia. I think that that has been uh, kind of the interim solution when there is no real united front within NATO when it comes to dealing with Russia. So can you maybe expand upon those relationships because this is something you know the Biden administration is is having trouble uh, they even talked about sanctions against Germany because of the Nord Stream 2 project and now the energy prices are going up and Putin seems to be sending a message to Europeans saying look you need me for energy uh, in the meantime and uh, many European countries rely on Russian uh, gas, including Turkey. Uh, what kind of a challenge is that for for NATO? Uh, you know, uh, when you can't create a common fr front against uh, Russia, and then many members uh, are realizing they ha they need to deal with Russia on multiple fronts. Uh, what happens then to NATO Russia relationship? And there's a strife within NATO itself. In the previous NATO summit, we, we saw this, this rift. And in fact, the Americans especially would like to attract European partners in their global search of security. And China and Russia were defined as uh, the main threats, global threats. But for Europeans, including Turkey, I, I see Turkey as a European partner in this equation. Uh, for Turkey and Germany mainly, and the other European actors, especially Eastern European actors, do not think that Russia is a direct threat. Uh, it is a different perception than Americans. And China is totally a different story. 
And Turkey and Germany, as big actors within Europe, and different than the other European actors, especially Western members of the European alliance, uh, we are totally different than the others in, in terms of threat perception, uh, the definition of interest, and looking at the relationship with Russia in the near future. For Russia, uh, for Germany, for example, Russia is a partner country like Turkey. For Russians, there are two big European partners. One is Germany, the other one is Turkey. Uh, Russians are ready and they will like to work together with Germany and Turkey. And Turks and Germans are ready to work together with Russians. And then those energy related projects and trade relationship, security understanding of those European two European actors uh, are very identical and similar to each other. And then if Germans and Turks manage to get together to deal with Russia in terms of better cooperation in different areas and to find some uh, middle way between the other members of the transatlantic alliance and Russia, it may work. More than that, I can easily say that uh, Russia, for example, helps Germans to support energy security of other European countries. And Turkish-Russian relations is a kind of a, an exemplary relations for the Eastern European countries. Being a Western actor, have some priorities, but on the other hand, uh, finding some ways and means to deal with Russians. This is a, an exemplary attitude and identity. Uh, what is important here in this equation is Russian attitude. If the Russians uh, keep their position as a reliable partner, not only on the field of energy, but on the security and the other issues as well, if they change their uh, attitude towards being, let me say, less aggressive on some issues, and if they again change their attitude in, in a line that to resolve some issues in regional issues, security issues, then most probably Turkey and Germany play a, a kind of a uh, facilitative role to, to bring uh, Russia and the NATO alliance countries all together and to talk together again. And this is, uh, of course, not a mission impossible, but a tough job for all of us. Uh, even for Germany, uh, we, we know that Germany is transforming itself in terms of political environment. Uh, we have some issues in Turkey as well, but you know, politics is politics and international relations is international relations. The parties are ready to talk and to get together. They, they have their own interest. Therefore, I see a kind of a chance, not only uh, for Turkey, for Russia, but for Germany as well, but not in the short run, most probably in the mid run, we will see some developments. Uh, Mr. Çelikpala, while talking about Germany and Turkey and their position in both NATO and Europe, I think we need to maybe also mention S-400 as far as Turkey is concerned, because that is one of the areas of, uh, I think, divergence between Turkey and its NATO members, uh, especially with US. In that context, how easy it would be for Germany and Turkey to be a facilitator when US uh, president is uh, supposed to be very tough on Russia? Uh, that's true, but you know, US is just one country, or mem one member. Of course, it's a heavyweight member of NATO alliance, but this is just one member. And we know that the US not, was not as successful as they would like to or the, the, the current administration was not successful to, 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 to show uh, NATO a new direction for the security apparatus. European interests are different than the Americans. And this is the thing. And each and every nation have uh, just observed its own interests. And this is the, the, the key word most probably. Uh, of course, we have many issues, but this S-400 and the others uh, individual issues are non -related, not related with uh, the, the broader perspective. It is the case uh, Turkey needs to uh, normalize, in quote, uh, and, and restructure its relations with the Western member countries from different perspectives. But again, uh, Turkey is one of the biggest actors and, and factors in all those regional issues. An old NATO member country with a huge army and, and Turkey is ready to resolve all those regional issues in a constructive manner. This is a positive thing. And the other side of the equation, most probably Russians are ready to work with Turkey and Germany in those issues. Of course, 
the best case for Russians is to deal with the Americans as a global power because they equalize themselves with the US in terms of uh, global issues. And then there are three actors for Russians, global actors, China, Russia, and the US. They are complaining the American attitude, not treating Russia as a global actor. If the Americans change their attitude and approach towards Russia, most probably uh, they they prefer to one to talk one or bilateral relations with the US. But I don't see such a kind of an environment under current circumstances. And that makes Turkey and Germany as a European actors to play such a kind of a game. Uh, but of course, Russia is not an uh, answer for Turkey and Germany to resolve their own issues with the Americans and other NATO or European member countries. Right, Kadir, uh, let me turn to you because we mentioned US administration on a number of times. I think there is a difference between the Trump administration and the Biden administration when, when it comes to dealing with, with Russia. To what extent the new policy of uh, Biden administration will have an impact on such relations, such complex relationship uh, actually? Well, Biden administration may have overpromised a bit when it comes to Western unity and addressing the challenge of China and addressing the challenge of uh, Russia. Uh, like we've been discussing, many European uh, NATO allies have different interests and there is a recognition that we won't be able to be on the same page on all issues like it used to be in the Cold War because the common threat is just not there and it's perceived differently by different countries. And we saw that in the Brussels summit, summit like Professor Çelikpala mentioned. Uh, to Biden administration's response to this, their solution for the time being is to broaden the agenda. So NATO will, you know, transform itself uh, in the new era next 10 years and it will talk about uh, cyber security, climate change, etc. So, so that it can keep all its allies on the same page on a number of issues and come up with a common strategy. But broadening the agenda will probably not be a solution uh, because, you know, when you have so many issues on the agenda, it's going to be less and less likely to get units in unity or common agreement among the among the allies. We should also remember that, you know, the, the when it comes to you mentioned for as 400 US actually was not exactly on the same page on that with NATO. NATO, you know, general secretary said it is the national sort of sovereign decision of the country's allies to purchase whatever defense systems they wanted. So even when it comes to that, uh, yes, they said it wasn't compatible with NATO systems, but it, they didn't. NATO itself didn't say you cannot buy it. And um, whereas the U.S. Congress and U.S. politicians made it clear that was a, a no-no for for a variety of reasons. My, the point I'm trying to make is that something I, I mentioned at the beginning, right? The U.S. is finding it hard to create unity and um, cooperation, deepened cooperation among the Western allies. As remember, uh, Trump really attacked the liberal order that the US established since the Second World War. It, he took issue with pretty much everything, including NATO and uh, multilateral institutions of the Western world. Uh, Biden decided that he was going to just reverse all of that. But he's he's finding it very very difficult um, for the reasons we've discussed. But again, for Washington, the main challenge, the number one challenge, is China. That's part of the reason why they are not assigning that status of superpower to Russia, like Professor Chelikpala was was discussing. So. Uh, in the meantime, they would like to, I think the US ultimately would like a cooperative relationship with Russia on, in, in issues like Syria, for instance, right? The US wants to leave Syria ultimately, but they need some sort of political deal on the ground and Russia is the kingmaker there. 
So uh, to be able to focus on China, they need Russia. But uh, Russia will not be completely on the side of the U.S. when it comes to dealing with China because they want to play the game of uh, keeping both U.S. and China as, you know, weak as possible, I guess, in, in international diplomacy while, you know, they assert their own uh, position. So um, I think it's a tough game for Biden administration uh, and coming up with a common strategy is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, Talib Hojam, I actually wanted to ask you that, uh, how uh, the Syria, you know, there were recent attacks in Idlib and um, as we know, both Assad regime and Russia have been insisting that, you know, those are basically, um, they're not saying it openly, but they ultimately would like it to be, uh, you know, under the regime control. And that the U.S. Um, seems still not so, you know, vocal as they used to be under Trump administration. How does Syria determine Turkey's perspective on Russia, in your opinion? Well, as you know, Turkey and Russia has been have been working on the Syrian affairs for uh, a number of years now, because when U.S. decided to leave the scene, uh, as you have said, uh, Syria emerged as the kingmaker in the region, and therefore Turkey had to work with it, Russia. Sorry, and that means uh, and Turkish-Russian relations in this perspective will continue. And of course, there is a rift between Turkey and the U.S. Uh, as far as the uh, financing and supporting and arming PYD and YPG uh, is concerned. I think that plays an important role. Secondly, Turkey is working with the European Union because there is a, a deal between the uh, two sides on the issue of Syrian refugees. And as we all know, there is a something looming threat in Idlib if uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, fragile stability or whatever we call it is uh, fallen and, uh, apart, there will be another wave of uh, immigration. And I think President Erdogan made it very clear that uh, Turkey will not be uh, able to absorb and I think it will be too much of a burden for Turkey and then Europe and other countries will also take some responsibility. You can see that there is a, a you know, there is not a very clear, I think, roadmap there as, as far as uh, US is concerned. Uh, they have been uh, still uh, talking about how to fight uh, Daesh. Daesh might uh, re-emerge there too. I think that makes uh, Turkey, European Union, and uh, uh, Russia to be on the same side. At least to find some sort of political solution. But of course, Turkey is the uh, country that is most, I think, influenced because of the development there. I think Turkey will continue to work with Russia. Uh, because there is not much of another option. Of course, sometimes Turkey also, also talks to Iran, Iran, as you know, but, but I think uh, unless US uh, comes, comes to the table, this status quo, quo as we see today, unfortunately, the uh, conflict or the frozen conflict, let's say, became a status quo in Syria today. So there is no uh, immediate political solution. There is no military solution. Professor Çerikbala, uh, thanks for joining us today again. I want to close with one last question. Um, so, given all these complexities that the Europeans experience in their relationship with Russia, and then U.S. Uh, would like, you know, Russia to be, you know, less influential in the region, and then kind of confronted in many ways when it comes to, you know, intervention in uh, elections in the West, uh, its kind of spying efforts, let's say, and then the poisoning of Navalny issues like that. How do you think that the NATO allies uh, can create a common front against uh, Russia? Is that even possible or is this going to continue this kind of mixed picture uh, that we've been discussing? When we look at the Western relations with NATO from a historical perspective, most of the time, especially when the ideological rivalry is, is prevailing around, uh, the Western actors, Atlantic and European partners were on the same page, as you said. Uh, Russia was a threat to global security and it was uh, the threat perception was the same and the resolution or the proposition to resolve this uh, threat was the same. But now, you know, uh, for the Europeans and the Americans, threat perceptions has changed a lot. 
Russia is not that kind of a threat to European network. And there are a couple of issues, but there are other uh, venues to cooperate with Russia. And Americans always there to support European security. Now Americans are prioritizing different security apparatus and their security perception has changed a lot. And the American threat perception is not the European threat perception. And then as a result, most probably Europeans need to concentrate their own needs and their own priorities. And their needs and priorities necessitates to work together with Russia one way or another. And uh, if you put the humanitarian issues aside, human rights related issues aside, Europeans are smart to deal with Russia uh, very pragmatically. And most probably in the com coming future, they are going to find some ways and means to deal with Russia in a pragmatic way. But it has some direct effects on transatlantic relations. This is happening to us as well, uh, to, to, to Turkey. And this is the reason why Turkey is time to time facing with some serious issues with the Americans because American involvement or American Turkish relations have seen as a kind of a security related issues from Turkish perspective as well. Americans contributed very positively to Turkey's security threats and take security issues. When we lost this connection just because of Syria or what's happening in the Black Sea area, what's happening in the in the, in the Caucasus, we lost American connections. This is the case for Europeans now. Americans have their their own priorities and the European partners are not ready to con con contribute such a kind of a uh, perspective. Maybe this is the reason why I am saying uh, and I'm standing in this position. And this is the reason why I'm expecting such a kind of a European move towards Russia in a positive manner. Thank you very much for your comments and thank you for joining us on today's program, Turkey Talks. Uh, we are out of time right now, uh, so we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure.